during that tour, you met a very pretty lady um, who seemed to find something in a junior technician uh, that she uh, found attractive, despite you getting her very wet on the back of your motorcycle. <laughs> That's when you met your wife, wasn't it? It was, Nick. Uh, to back up one, yes, on the motorcycle, my motorcycle interest had actually started at Halton when a, one of my uh, combat line modeling friends, he actually had a motorbike himself. And we weren't allowed to have motorcycles on base at RAF Halton as an apprentice. So we, we kept them down the local village, probably illegally in, in, in a storage <laughs> shed, a village called Wendover. And uh, th that dear motorbike, yeah, very special. So when I met Marin, that was part of my life and she kind of had to get used to it, I suppose. We met at a Halloween party at the gliding club and I'd never met her, seen her even before. She used to come up to the gliding club because she was with a farming, uh, a farmer and his family from Norway. Marin came over to improve her English. And this farmer, because of his engineering skills, was a special member of the gliding club. So Marin actually used to come up to the airfield quite often and sit in the bus and have her cup of tea. And I was always very busy, never went into the bus. I was either on the winter or driving tractors or flying. So we never met until that Halloween party. And uh, yes, the old saying, eyes met across a crowded room and the rest, uh, the rest was history. Well, it certainly sounds like you hit it off pretty quickly. Now, it must have been very hard for you because your dream of becoming an Air Force pilot has been dashed. But although you had the gliding on the side to keep you interested, uh, what did you think about your future? Did you really imagine you were ever going to do what you wanted? I never lost that that dream, uh, Nick. Never. It, it was in there. It wasn't going to be taken away. Flying just meant so much for me, to me. Can I just say that I started my aviation career gliding. Um, I know people will think I'm biased, and of course I am, but the reality, I feel this very strongly, that starting an aviation career, um, developing an aviation interest at all, the best way to start is through gliding. It really is. It, it rams home the fundamentals, stick and rudder usage, of course, but airmanship, basic airmanship, lookout, all of that sort of thing, a feel for the air, and those elements, that foundation will stand any budding pilot in very good stead right throughout his aviation career. But to come back to this, this friend uh, the, he, who became a close friend, Tug Wilson, he was a Hastings pilot, the CFI of the gliding club. He knew my passion for flying. And yeah, he got the application off station. So then I was able to paddle my own canoe and the assessments and everything at Biggin Hill went well. And, and I was accepted. So I had to go to South Sony for officer training, which was interesting in its own right. And then on towards, uh, yes, the flying, flying training system. Now, it seems that everything was slotting into place for you. Um, how did you get on? Uh, you'd had a difficult start to your Air Force career, but now you were in the flying training system. Were you worried? Uh, did you excel? How, what happened? Well, I started my powered flying training on the dear venerable chipmunk, which I thoroughly enjoyed, actually. And yeah, it, 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 it was a great machine as a basic trainer. I do remember a mistake I made one day and that I was feeling perhaps a little bit off, maybe a little bit of a cold developing. And I stupidly, instead of crying off the, the training sortie, went along with it. And I'll never forget that flight. <laughs> I learned a very valuable lesson. That if one has a little bit of anything, you do not fly, end of story. And certainly in, a, in, in an unpressurized, little bit drafty chipmunk, it wasn't, it wasn't my finest moment. But uh, no, the aircraft was very good. I forget how long that lasted, frankly, how many hours, but that was the start. And then of course, on to the Jet Provost at basic flying training at RAF Leeming. The training went well. And uh, I, was, I was always, I have to say, a very competitive person by nature. Looking back, I realized that from very early in life, we had a relaxing, what should be in casual, friendly game of cards as a family, like, 
I had to win. I mean, it's as simple as that. I, 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 I just had to win. So the competitive spirit was in there and that manifested at Leeming because I managed to win uh, four of the six prizes that were available, including uh, the Sword of Honor. So, I mean, of course, I would say the course went very well. <laughs> well, it went excellently. You must have looked wonderful at the front of the, the uh, graduation parade. Yes, I led the parade with the sword and everything, which was really wonderful. And uh, Marin and I, we, our courtship continued. She was in London with another, a, a small group of Norwegian girls, but we saw each other reasonably regularly. Now, the RAF had a, what I consider to be a rather Victorian attitude towards marriage in that they considered an RAF officer not to be sufficiently mature to get married until the ripe old age of 25. And if one chose to get married below that age, one suffered the consequences in that you didn't get any marriage allowance, just as an example, so you couldn't have a married quarter. But Marin and I were deeply in love and there was no way we were waiting until 25. And we agreed that at the end of the BFTS, we would get married. And that happened in December 68. Now that's actually uh, quite a difficult thing for most people to cope with because uh, being a bachelor and involving yourself in your flying course uh, is probably enough for most people without having uh, a wife and, uh, on the you know, waiting for you at home um, and to distract you as it were. So obviously you were able to stay single-mindedly on, on track. Well, as I say, the marriage didn't happen until the end of the course, but I did see her either I went down to London or she came up to uh, the Yorkshire area and we, we saw each other reasonably regularly. But then, yes, things moved on. We moved to uh, Shrewsbury where we had a little, a little flat together and money was unbelievably tight. Uh, looking back, it's hard to imagine how we actually managed, but some, it was a good training, I guess, financial management for later in life. And at that time, aviation wise, and there was, there was a gap between BFTS and going to advanced flying at RAF Valley in Anglesey. So that's where they sent me and I flew with the, uh, with the vampire and the instructor, no, not instructor, the pilots were ex-World War II non-commissioned uh, non NCOs, very experienced, very, very, very competent pilots. So I flew with them and we just went round and round and flew radar circuits following the directions of these trainee, trainee air traffic controllers. So it was enjoyable, the vampire didn't I didn't fall in love with the machine. The cockpit was relatively small and tight and I'm sort of six foot two, six foot three. So I did sort of crunch myself up in the cockpit a little bit, but no, no, it, it was good. And uh, married life was wonderful, of course, finally. One note of tragedy during that time was that one evening there was a knock on the door of our little apartment and I opened the door and there was a, there was a policeman. I thought, oh, what on earth have I done? And he came with the rather sad news that my father had died at the far too young age of uh, 52. So that was, yeah, that was, that was a very, very sad note indeed. From there on to RAF Valley, advanced flying training. Now you flew, I guess, because of your size in the slightly larger Hunter instead of the, the tiny Nat. Um, but you did very well uh, on your course at Valley as well, didn't you? Yes, you're right, Nick. The NAT, uh, I've, I have flown in a NAT as a passenger during a Red Arrows practice session, which was amazing. But yes, very cramped, very tight. So I ended up, it was wonderful. I, actually, it, it couldn't have worked out better because the largest setup was the NAT that was over at one side of the airfield at Valley. And then way over the other side near the beach was this small little hunter, hunter-like squadron it was just beautiful very small setup and um, we had wonderful instructors a really good boss and away from a lot of the flying training stuff that went on over the other side of the airfield and i started off of course in the hunter t7 and then finally went on solo on on the six the f6 which was 
an amazing experience because there's, for a start, there's a significant thrust difference between the T7 and, and the F6. There really is. Secondly, these uh, these sixes had all the weapons and armament and uh, gun side, you name it, removed. So the weight was significantly lower than a normal operational role fit. And uh, the performance, like the power to weight ratio, was, uh, was stunning. I, I think I caught up with the airplane on that first flight about 10,000 feet. It was <laughs> absolutely. But everything I've read and heard about the Hunter was just absolutely underlined for me. It is the most magnificent aircraft to fly. And I just feel so privileged to have flown it. The handling is superb, the stability, everything about the aircraft was just right. And the saying that if an aircraft looks right, it usually is right, was just came to be proven to me completely. That's very true. I think we all felt the same about it. What was the nickname uh, we used to give that uh, Hunter F6? Yeah, they called it the GT6. <laughs> yeah, <yes. laughs>